ions and the stability of atoms. We're going to quickly look at how we can talk about atoms uh, with those dot diagrams. We'll look at what ions are, different types of ions, and, and why atoms are going to be forming these ions. So first thing, a tool we use to quickly and concisely refer to atoms is a Lewis dot diagram. This is a simplified version of a Bohr-Rutherford diagram. If we're going to be doing some chemistry with these, we probably aren't going to need to worry about the nucleus and probably never have to worry about the inner electrons. Chemistry is going to be happening with those outer electrons. So a Lewis dot diagram focuses just on the outer electrons, also known as the valence electrons. So these show the element symbol and then draws out how many outer or valence electrons that atom has. So if you if you look at your Bohr Rutherfords for say a lithium, it's going to have two electrons in the inner shell and then it's going to have a single electron in the outer shell. So a Lewis dot diagram would just draw the symbol for lithium and put one electron in the outer shell. Beryllium is going to have two electrons in the in shell, inner shell and then two on the outer shell. So the Lewis dot diagram, again, ignores the nucleus, ignores the inner shells, just draws electrons on the outer shells. Boron has three electrons in its outer shell. Carbon has four electrons in its outer shell. So the Lewis dot diagrams for these elements are just the symbol with the number of electrons in the outer shell. Notice how I'm drawing these. We tend to start at the top and then to go to the right and then to the bottom and then to the left and then once we've placed four then we start pairing the electrons in here it's not critical that we do that um, but it does actually model how the electrons behave in a little bit more detail than we're going to be getting into right now um, but occasionally if you if you need to show some bonding and you have to draw them slightly differently that's not not a huge deal um, do make sure though you get the correct number and again once you have four, then you can start pairing them. So if we look at neon, it is going to have eight valence electrons. It also has those two inner ones, but we ignore them with the Lewis dot diagram. Um, and so that is how we draw Lewis dot diagrams. Very quick way, almost the same amount of information as the Bohr-Rutherford diagram, but it's really just focusing on those valence electrons. Now, the reason why we do this is so that we can show what's going to happen when the atom um, does something. It goes through a chemical reaction or, or, or um, becomes more stable or bonds to something or forms an ion. So we, we're always going to be looking at those valence electrons for these things to have uh, to happen with the atom. Um, the reason why they happen is because atoms are trying to become more stable. They're going to have some stability inherent to them, but there are ways in which they may be able to become more stable. And what we found is that it, it seems that having a full valent shell of electrons, that seems to be stable for an atom. So if you look at neon, we know this is the second shell, and we know that the, the, the first shell holds two electrons, the second holds eight, the third holds eight, and then the fourth, we're going to only put two because that gets us to calcium. That's as far as we're going to go with Bohr-Rutherford diagrams. But if an atom has these valence shells filled, it happens to be stable. So neon here, the second shell can hold eight and neon has eight electrons. Neon is stable. So it would, it would seem that having a full outer shell is what atoms want. It is what makes them stable. Therefore, if you look at these other atoms here, they're not yet stable. They can become stable if they can get a full outer shell, but currently they don't have a full outer shell. So what atoms will do is they will change in a way that gives them a full outer shell. For example, fluorine here. It is almost stable, like neon, but it's not. And so in order to become like neon, it would have to gain one more electron. So this explains the behavior of fluorine. This is why atoms will form ions. So atoms want to become stable. It's their goal in life. Atoms will do so by gaining or losing electrons to get that full outer shell. And when they do that, they become charged and a charged atom is called an ion. 
So they do this to obtain stability. They want to look like those stable noble gases at the end of their, their, their row there, at the end of the period there. These noble gases have full valence shells, and that's what the other atoms are trying to get. Um, another name for this is an octet. It's not a perfect name because we know that the second shell can hold eight and the third shell can hold eight. And so a lot of elements are trying to get eight into their outer shell, but not all of them, right? Helium is perfectly happy. Um, it's probably the happiest element around um, and it only has two in there. So realize that the word octet is a bit of a generalization. What we really mean is a full outer shell. So we can refer to this kind of uncomfortably as the octet rule. And again, the idea that atoms will form ions, they will gain or lose electrons in order to become like their nearest noble gas and nearest, the easiest one to get to. That does not always mean gaining electrons. They could also lose electrons to become, to, to end up with the next shell down being full. The fancy word we can use to describe when an atom has the same electron configuration as a noble gas is isoelectronic. So we could say that fluorine, once it gains an electron, it would then have eight electrons in its outer shell. Neon also has eight electrons in its outer shell. So those two, the fluoride ion and the neon atom, are isoelectronic. So we can see a pattern developing here. And, and these, uh, you can see there's some elements missing from, from this ionic charge trend here. Um, but the pattern that we see is that elements in column one, so this is column one. And if you look at the Roman numerals in most periodic tables, probably the best way to look at it because it skips over these transition elements, which uh, are a little bit more complicated. Um, so column one, those are the elements that have one valence electron. So if you're to draw a Lewis dot diagram, lithium would have one and sodium would have one and potassium would have one. Um, they all have one electron in their, their valence shell. So if they lose that one electron, the next shell down is going to be full. So they form ions with a charge of positive one. If we look at column two, Roman numerals, um, we see that these are the ones that have two electrons in their valence shell. So they tend to form uh, ions with positive two as their charge, or two positive is probably the way to write it, um, as their ionic charge. So column one ends up with an ionic charge of one, column two ends up with an ionic charge of two. Skip over the transition elements, and we end up over here. Uh, the Roman numeral would be column 13. The uh, Non-Roman numeral would, would name it uh, column 13. The, the Roman numeral would put it as column three if you skip over the 10 transition elements. Um, but these tend to get a charge of positive three. Now, you'll notice there's no charge written for these ones here. Um, they tend to share electrons, and we'll get into that when we start talking about molecules. Um, but realize that these ones here would have four electrons in their valence shell. So they're sort of halfway. They could lose the four electrons and have a full, the next one down, or the next uh, shell full, or they could gain four electrons. So right in the middle there. Um, so they're a little bit trickier, trickier to say what ionic charge they can have. Um, and often they, they will form actual molecules instead of charged ions. The next one over, we have column 15. So you can imagine that these guys here have one, two, three, four, five, um, or again, Roman numeral five. So the Roman numeral is the number of valence electrons in the outer shell. Now, these ones again, let me make that a little bit clearer here. There is two electrons in the top there, total of five around nitrogen here. So could lose five electrons, but it's got a long way to go. That's, that's going to be pretty hard for it to do because remember, it's got the protons in the middle. So if you start pulling off electrons, it's going to be harder and harder to pull the next electron off because the protons are going to be even more attracted to the remaining electrons. So what's actually easier is if it gains three electrons. And so if it's gaining these negative electrons, it ends up with get some room here, a charge of three negative as its ionic charge. Oxygen, again, that's this column 16. So we know it has six electrons in the outer shell. You guys can draw better Lewis dot diagrams than this, but we've got six electrons in the outer shell. And so it is only two electrons away from being isoelectronic with neon. And so it will 
form ionic uh, ions with an ionic charge of two negative. And then of course your halogens here, they're just one away from being isoelectronic with their noble, nearest noble gas. And so they're, they're definitely gonna have an ionic charge of one negative. So let's take a more detailed look at one atom in particular. And again, you could apply the same concept for each of those. So here's the long way of drawing the information about the sodium atom, but uh, we're not gonna be drawing a whole lot of Bohr Rutherfords because it takes too much time. So we have the Lewis dot diagrams to make that a little bit shorter. And again, trying to predict the ionic charge of sodium, you look at how many electrons are in the outer shell, which is the only information you see in a Lewis dot diagram. It has one valence electron. So it could maybe gain seven electrons, but it's gonna be really whole, hard for those protons to hang on to an extra seven electrons. That would give a full outer shell. But there's no way that the nucleus could hang on to that many electrons. So instead, what's a whole lot easier is if it just loses that one electron, then the next shell down is going to be full. And so what sodium does is it becomes a sodium ion by losing that one valence electron. And if you'd looked at the Bohr Rutherford, you would see that there's now only 10 electrons, there is 11 protons, and therefore it ends up with a charge of one positive. And the, the proper way to write ionic charges is you put the number first and then the positive after. And chemists hate writing ones. Um, so often when we, when we say one, we just don't write the one. Um, and so we would just put a positive. So we know that that means one positive. So the charge of one positive. And if it is an ion, we also communicate that information by putting it in square brackets. So atoms, again, they don't just let go of their electrons. They don't just fly off into space. Um, the, the, the nucleus is there. It's holding on to those electrons. They are attracted to the nucleus. So the reason why they lose their electron is, is not that it goes flying off on its own. It's that there's something else that comes along that wants that electron more. It's, it's, it's more attracted to that electron. It's able to pull that electron off um, more so than the atom itself is able to hang on to it. So there's other atoms involved in this ionization. Um, so it's just a matter of who wants that electron more. If one atom wants an electron more than another, it will take that electron away from the atom that's not that attracted to it. It'll get transferred between one atom and another. What this would look like is that again, sodium it's got this one electron. It would be more stable without that one electron in its outer shell. So we'll lose it, but it can't just shoot them away. Um, it, it, they are picked up by another atom. And this is where our chemical reactions happen is the transfer of electrons or there's sharing of electrons. Um, but that electron is actually going to be picked up by another atom or moved or transferred from one atom to the other. So an atom that would like to have an electron would be say chlorine. So sodium and chlorine will react with each other. You have sodium that is willing to lose one electron because if it loses that one electron, its next shell down is full. We have chlorine that has seven electrons in its outer shell. So if it gains an electron, this would become eight and it would have a full outer shell. And then both sodium and chlorine would be happy. And in this case, it's a one sodium can make one chlorine happy. And that ratio is really important to describe how this is going to happen. We know that it will happen because we have something that wants to lose and something that wants to gain, so it will happen. And then the ratio in which it happens will actually give us our chemical formulas. So sodium loses its electron, and again, it would become positively charged. So the positive one charge, our chlorine gains that electron and it becomes an ion with a one negative charge the one on both of them there. And if we're drawing the diagrams um, for their ions, we wanna make sure that they are in square brackets. So atoms that lose electrons become positively charged. The name we call them is cations. If you write the T as a plus, you'll never forget their name. Um, because there's of course a name for negatively charged ions as well. And we call those one anions. There are some atoms um, that can become stable because remember they're, they're doing this to become stable, right? And so there are some atoms that can become stable in more than one way. And so we know sodium, definitely it's gonna lose one electron, then it's stable, that's it. But there are other atoms that, that maybe, maybe they could lose one or maybe they could lose two. And in both cases, they're more stable than they would have been otherwise. So there's 
multiple ways to become stable. Therefore, there's multiple ways for them to lose electrons, and therefore, they would end up with multiple charges. They could have one charge, or they could have the other. Not the same time, it'll have one or the other. So they have uh, more than one ion, and again, the name for this is multivalent. For example, iron, it likes to lose electrons, as metals do, um, and it can lose two electrons and become stable, or it could lose three electrons and become stable. So as such, it could form an iron with a three plus charge or an iron with a two plus charge. Both of these are possible, and therefore iron is multivalent. It has multiple valences. It has multiple ways of losing electrons to become stable. It has multiple charges. Then there are groups of atoms that will form a group that as a group has lost or gained electrons. They're like a team that essentially is sort of sharing their electrons or they're you know, got like, a, like a molecule uh, sharing their electrons, but they're either short electrons or they have an excess of electrons. And we call these, they're, they're ions, so they definitely have a charge, but they are polyatomic. It's a group of atoms. There's more than one poly, more than one atom, and they have a charge. So two examples that we have here, um, one group of atom that is lost its electron, uh, an electron. So a nitrogen can form a group with four hydrogens and the group of them can have a charge of plus one, and that is an ammonium ion. And again, um, we could put that in square brackets and say, okay, here, this ammonium ion, this group of atoms, together, they're, they're all connected together, but the group of them is short one electron, therefore it has a positive one charge. Then we have negatively charged, and most of the polyatomics that we're gonna be looking at will be negatively charged. There is a group of nitrogens and oxygens that can form together as a group, and this is not nitrogen trioxide. This is not a molecule. And you know it's not a molecule because it has a charge, right? That is the only way that we know that these are ions. So look for those charges, and if it's an ion, make sure you put the charges. And so since this has a charge, it is an ion, and as such, uh, we have to name it accordingly. And so these polyatomic ions will have specific names. This is a group, one nitrogen, three oxygens, with a charge of negative one, and, it, and its name is nitrate. 